Dan Humphreys and head coach Bobby Ross. I think that there's a tremendous amount of character in our football team and in our players, and I honestly believe that that's what's helped us to get where we are right now, and I don't think we've forgotten that. A revealing look at Natron Mean, who isn't surprised by his own success. I wanted to start last year. I mean, there were games when I would come out and I would play well and I didn't get the start and I'd be kind of frustrated. And our own Jimmy Johnson comes down hard on the Cowboys' most recent problems. And, you know, they've got to, you know, take this into consideration and not party quite so much after a victory or even after a loss. And now, from San Diego, home of the 6-1 Chargers, here are your hosts, Glenn Dawson, Nick Bonacati, Chris Collinsworth, and Jimmy Johnson. Borrowing some of the swagger usually associated with teams in Northern California, fans in San Diego hope to egg on Stan Humphreys and the Chargers, who found themselves short-circuited last Sunday by the Broncos. And while the Chargers weren't showing much spark on offense, John Elway may have jump-started Denver's season. Out of the gun, back to throw with pressure. Steps up, looks, 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 throws long. He's got sharp open. He caught it at the five, and he's in for the end zone. Touchdown, Denver. With his Broncos off life support for the time being, Wade Phillips hopes for more of a recovery this week against the Browns. Well, there's a big buck kicking contest today, and uh, Cincinnati's supplying the butt. That thing will power up, baby. The Browns indeed kicked Bengal butt, sending Cincinnati's offense back to the drawing board. They started like this. They started in a 57. Right. Head up, but they were offset. Head up. Head up. If, 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 we're, if we're talking 29, if you're off the game plan, not the rub, just grace. Big Daddy Wilkinson's beautifully executed spin move earned the top draft choice his first professional sack. It was one of the few high spots for the Bengals, and it caused a concussion that plagued Vinny Testaverde the rest of the afternoon. That was Big Daddy, right? Yeah. Did he do that on the K-67 thing at the start of the game, or did he just react back that way on that thing? All right, just tighten your Amy points a little bit on him, okay? There's two things that's happened out there right now. Number one, we got them on the run a little bit, all right? They're starting to play a little bit more man coverage. So let's get after their ass, stay after them, just stay after them, and let's keep making plays, all right? We're going to go down and score a touchdown this next round. Let's go now! Let's go now, let's go now Randy! The Browns have lost fullback Tommy Bardell for the season. Last week, Leroy Horde, his replacement, paced their attack with a pair of touchdowns. And to the five, still on his feet. Cleveland's energy came from their special team. His own goalpost. Here goes the snap. It's high. Pulls it down. Oh, it's blocked. Rolls in the end zone. Travis Hill. Hill recovers. Touchdown, Cleveland Brown. The special teams come up big. And the Browns take the lead, 19-13. On back-to-back -back punts in the space of a minute 47, the Browns' special teams broke open the game with two touchdowns. The last was by Eric Metcalf, who on opening day had burned the Bengals in exactly the same way. 5 to the 40, 35, all the way back to the 30. Now he eludes a man. 35 down the sideline. 50, one man to beat. 40, 35, forget it. Amazing. How would you like to be beaten today? Eric Metcalf and the Cleveland Browns special teams not only asked that question, but they have an answer for it. 6 and 1, baby, go 7 and 1 next week, baby. That's all I got to say, baby. And Cleveland could well go 7-1 with a win in Denver on Sunday, while the hapless Bengals most likely will be 0-8 for 8 after entertaining the Dallas Cowboys. <laughs> Throughout the course of the season, contenders must prove their resiliency, their ability to bounce back from defeat. 
After suffering key injuries to their offensive line and a pair of early losses, the 49ers have that spring in their step once more, especially Ricky Waters, who cut the struggling Bucks no slack. They get on the board first here today. Taylor out to the left side, handoff to Waters. Breaks outside, he's got the angle, I think. Five, dive, touchdown 49ers! Waters hit the century mark for the first time this season, while the Niner defense just went out and hit. Steve Young bounced back with his first 200-yard passing game in a month and bounced off a bunch of bungling Buccaneer defenders as San Francisco cruised to an easy 25-point win. Inside, touchdown, 49ers. It is Tampa Bay seems to have unhitched the bungee cord altogether and will likely continue their free fall against the Vikings this week. Minnesota got a jump start on the action by playing on Thursday, but one Viking was whistled for a false start before the game even began. When the opening whistle finally did blow, Brett Favre soon wished it hadn't as he was knocked out of the game. His replacement, Mark Brunel, however, ran the Packers to a 10-7 halftime lead. Seconds to snap it, gets it snapped. Now you're on a quarterback draw. He'll go, he'll go. Scores a touchdown. Quarterback Workmanlike defense, less than daring play calling, and a lone field goal were the lowlights in a yawner of a second half. And in overtime, the Vikings finally prevailed. The snap from Moore, spotted, booted, the kick on the way, and the kick in! Green Bay trails Minnesota and Chicago and will meet the Bears this week in a pivotal showdown. For Bear quarterback Eric Kramer, it was homecoming in the Silverdome. Kramer is the last quarterback to take the Lions to the NFC Championship game, and his old buddies let him know that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Hey, bro, I'm still open. Still throw me the ball, and I'm still looking for it. All right, all right, bro. Stay healthy, baby. Awanstead's Bears were on fire, winners of three in a row, while Wayne Fonts was in the fire, having lost three straight. It was a mid-season test of character for Detroit. Perhaps Kramer was a bit over-anxious to impress his old fans. Perhaps Scott Mitchell felt the pressure of living up to his $11 million contract. Whatever the case, both teams made big mistakes instead of big plays. coming hard down inside that belly's gonna bounce outside to the nickel will all the time when the belly wearing number 20 bounced outside the game heated up in a hurry from the sweep to the five to the ten he's off to the races Bring it Bring it up. Up. it's a sprint 30 40 buried to midfield he's chased wolford on the angle at the 20 donnell wolford will chase him down inside the 10 yard line wolford had him on the angle that's the only way and he was going to catch up with Barry Sanders. After Barry ripped off 84 of his 167 yards, Lion linebacker Chris Spielman simply ripped off Chris Gedney for a 14 to nothing Lion lead. Stolen. Stolen by Spielman. 10, 5, touchdown. Nine. 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 Chris Spielman steals it for Chris Gedney and takes it out for the touchdown. Which is exactly what the Bears got just before the half. Kramer steps up over the middle of the end zone. Touchdown, Nate Lewis! Kramer put it on his fingertips, and I do mean a fingertip grab in the middle time of the out, end zone. Time out. Time out. Not time out. Time for Mel Gray, the NFL's all-time kick return leader. How did he set the record? Not by waving for the fair catch, but by racing straight up the middle. 102 yards later, he kissed them all goodbye. And he fangs it to Mel Gray. Waiting. A yard deep. He'll come out. 
the 10, middle of the field, 15, 20, he's got a seam, 30, 35, Bell, off to the races, far side, he's 50, 45, 40, 35, 30, he's gone, touchdown Lions, Bell for 101 yards, 101 yard kickoff return by Bell Gray. Kramer answered right back with a long distance play of his own. Back to the left, Kramer. Wings it deep down the left side. He's got Graham out there. Makes the catch to the 35. He's going the way. Despite two touchdown passes and over 300 yards by their old quarterback, Fonts and his Lions had a victory they hope to build on this week against the Giants. I want to say it was just a phenomenal effort by a bunch of players that a lot of people thought would fold. They did not fold. This team will continue to play well. There's no quitting this football team. It's a good program. I believe it, and so do they. Coming up, a look at the explosive Natron memes and an interview with quarterback Stan Humphrey. Off the field, he is anonymous. Natron means with his hip-hop 90s style, looks like an average 22-year-old, but oh, how looks can be deceiving. He's he just a country boy from North Carolina and has been blessed with a great deal of ability and loves to play the game. Georgia's winning, doing the Natron dance. Georgia's winning, doing the Natron dance. Busted britches weren't the only surprise in New Orleans where the ultra-conservative Rams and Saints busted loose from their predictable ways with big play. Back to throw, he sets, he's got time, winging a deep, Isaac Bruce, he's there for the touchdown! The style of this game was strictly a cloud of dust and 90 yards. Goal from inside the one, same formation, same call, same result. Neal doesn't get in. And the ball is being picked up by a ram and being run back downfield. They have stolen the ball, it would appear. On the far sideline, the Rams are taking it downfield. Will this stand? Toby Wright has the football, and the Rams have a touchdown. Unbelievable. Argument proved futile, so on the ensuing kickoff, the Saints went for the tie. Tyrone Hughes, who ran back two touchdowns and broke the NFL's single game records for kickoff return yards and combined return yards. Marks that had stood since 1950. Nine yard line up to the 20, running to the far side. There's a seed. He's up to the 40. Two men to beat. He's to the 40 of the Rams. 30, cuts it back. Still running. Tie on the fly. Touchdown, Saints! The Daily Double Points! Thanks to this week's bye, quarterback Jim Everett gets a full fortnight to savor the victory over his old team. While the veteran quarterback was responding to the call in Louisiana, a rookie quarterback got the call in Indiana, Gus Farratt. But first, he had to look and learn. Falk is on the left-hand side of Harbaugh, out of the shotgun spread, the direct snap from center, the rush is on, throws down the right side, and it is... When Gus got his chance, he made the most of it, throwing for two touchdowns and no interceptions. Gus throws into the corner of the end zone, and a touchdown! The catch is made! Right back to pass, looks, fires into the end zone, diving catch, touchdown, Redskins! In the fourth quarter, Andre Collins put the D back in D.C. Ah, it's going to be picked off for a touchdown! Going in, Andre Collins, step right in front of Roosevelt, Potts! The skins are no longer gloomy with Gus at the helm. This week they return home to the friendly confines of RFK to host the Eagles. Arrowhead Stadium has been anything but friendly for the Seahawks, who have only won there one time since 1981. On the field, Joe Montana was no Mr. Nice Guy either, throwing for two touchdowns. Seahawks did manage some success in spite of themselves. Hand off left side goes to Bonnie, runs into fire, now turns back to the right, heads for the near pylon. 
complete for the end zone. Touchdown, Seattle. When it comes to breaking games open, no one does it better than the venerable Marcus Allen. He put this game away and moved into fourth on the all-time touchdown list at the same time. Touchdown, Marcus Allen, as he breaks free over the middle, and Marcus Allen has just passed John Riggins. Fourth in the all-time touchdowns is 117th touchdown. Marcus Allen hits the end zone, 36-yard run. The Chiefs are just a game out of first in the AFC West and travel to Buffalo this week for a rematch of last year's AFC Championship. <laughs> Giants coach Dan Reeves appeared quite relaxed as he chatted with Pittsburgh counterpart Bill Cowher. But after pregame banter and good-natured handshakes, both teams meant business. Get out of here, boys. This is work time. This ain't nothing tonight. Not. We'll win. Very easy. Let's go, CB. Let's go, buddy. Big day, buddy. Big day. Big day. Let's go, buddy. Big day. Come on, all day. Let's go. All day. All day. Let's go. Come on, all day. Let's go. All day. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. What we got to do is play within ourselves and let's play hard. Let's bust our ass. 60 minutes and let's win this thing on three. One, two, three. Win. This would prove to be another frustrating day for the Giants as their offense struggled early, coming up empty on even the most perfect of plays. Motion by Rashid left. He's gonna pass. Pass is end zone. Touchdown cross. No. Oh, he dropped it as he went down. Well designed play. Should have been a touchdown, was not. New York settled for a field goal, while the Steelers' defense worked to correct its mistakes. It's going to be close to the back, yeah. so you got to go in the B gap opposite to me. Yeah. And see what we're doing? We're getting a lot of us up in there sometimes. The guys are just walking up disguised and not saying anything. So what we got to do before we leave the huddle, we got to make sure you talk to a guy and say, hey, I'm just going to walk up here. I'm on disguise or whatever, because what they're doing in the heat of battle down there, you don't know what the hell's going on. All right? Under Pittsburgh pressure, Big Blue continued to come up short. Fumble! Fumble is right! The Giants have lost the ball at the goal line. Are they saying he's down, Jimmy? No. No, they're not. His leg was down, his knee was down. No, nope, they're Pitt saying no. Pittsburgh ball. And a big break for Pittsburgh. Never say die, Pittsburgh. We can't let him step up. He does not have the speed to beat us outside. We want him outside. Okay? So let's like push the insane, pocket. We just gonna drive the pocket yeah. back. Drive the pocket yeah. back. That's what we want to do. We gotta get the ball down here. I know it. We gotta have him turn it over. We gotta turn it over. Turnover, man, really help. We need turnover. Hey D, we need another turnover. We need another turnover. Here is Davis to the left side. Shotgun formation. One on the right. Brown looks, 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 has time, throws, intercepted by Woodson at the 40-yard line, down to the 30 or 20-yard line. We talked about Woodson and talked about Woodson, they're still running with the ball, comes across field to the left. They, hit to, they threw to Woodson, they threw to Woodson, threw to Woodson, finally the old throw, grabbed the ball. Rod Woodson's interception gave Pittsburgh's offense the chance to finally capitalize on all the defense's hard work as rookie Bam Morris made up for two first-half fumbles with a six-yard score. With the 10-6 final, the Giants fall to 3-4, and four, while the Steelers take a 5-2 and two record on to Arizona. Stepping into a hostile desert environment can be a formidable task for some, but for the talent-laden Cowboys, pressure is nothing new. And love them or hate them, these Cowboys simply get the job done. Even a concussion couldn't keep Troy Aikman from finishing off the Cowboys' opening drive with a touchdown pass to Alvin Harper. 
The injury would force Aikman out of the game shortly thereafter, opening the door for a Cardinals team that was embarrassed by Dallas just two weeks earlier and staying away from the turnovers that plagued them in their first debacle, Arizona's offense produced 21 points. The Cardinals faithful finally had something to squawk about, but with Rodney Pete replacing Aikman, the Cowboys offense didn't skip a beat. Brooks in the end zone, up in the air, tip, caught, touchdown! Oh, wow, what a catch by Michael Irvin! That's an all-world Hall of Fame catch by Michael Irvin. Buddy Ryan's blitzing scheme sought to unsettle the Dallas quarterback, but with Emmett Smith and Darrell Johnston picking up the blitz, Pete was free to connect with Irvin a second time. This one good for 65 yards and a touchdown. That put Dallas back in the driver's seat and made it nine straight over the Cardinals. True champions always find a way to prevail, effectively dealing with adversity as it comes. And with all pro tackle Eric Williams possibly out for the season, Dallas will have to confront it again starting this Sunday in Cincinnati. Cowboys, they were able to win that game even though they're starting quarterback. Line tryouts for anyone who could catch on to their offense. Unfortunately for Houston, it was the same old story. No pass protection and a gambling defense which went bust, allowing big plays for the Philadelphia offense. Eagles wide receiver Fred Barnett lit up the Oilers with five catches, 187 yards, and a touchdown. He's rolling. He's throwing. He's going deep. He wants Barnett. He has it at the 10. He cuts back at the 5. He is down, and he's in! Randall Cunningham passed for over 300 yards and put the game away with a 35-yard touchdown toss to James Joseph. Houston has never beaten Philadelphia, but will try to find something to smile about this week against the Raiders. In Los Angeles, Halloween arrived early as the Raiders clashed with the Falcons. Atlanta was frightening at first, but their early 10 to nothing lead was unmasked and torn apart by the Raiders' pass rush, which made getting to Jeff George like taking candy from a baby. Jeff Hostetler led a Raider comeback, which came on the ground and through the air. Give to Williams, right side, gets outside, he's in, touchdown Raiders! Brown back to the wide side of the field, Hostetler setting it up, going over the middle, there's Brown, it's complete the 25-20, 15-10! The Raider faithful hope to have something more to scream about next week against Houston. The pages of Steve Largent's life read much like a storybook. Like most boys in Tulsa, Oklahoma, Steve dreamed about becoming a football player. After being told he was too small and too slow, Steve spent 14 years with the Seattle Seahawks and went to seven Pro Bowls. With six different career receiving records, Steve retired in 1989 as the greatest pass catcher in the history of the NFL. Steve's personal life would also appear to be the all-American dream. He married his high school sweetheart, he has four beautiful children, a successful business, and is a pillar in his church and hometown community. There's no question that I've been blessed, uh, and I recognize that every, every day of my life. Uh, but the other side of the coin is, is that uh, I've also known hardship in my life. Our fourth child was born with spina bifida, and it was one of the most devastating uh, things that ever took place in my life. It was one of the first times that I was faced with something that I had absolutely no control over. I couldn't make it better no matter 
how much money I had or what my position was or how many passes I caught, it wouldn't, it wouldn't make any difference. Eight years later, little Kramer's doing fine. But the concern about his son and the desire to make a difference in the lives of children has led Steve into a new arena, the world of politics. And I'm calling to uh, seek your support in my uh, race in the, for the House seat in the 1st District. Without question, Steve is the most recognizable candidate running for the U.S. House of Representatives from Tulsa's 1st District. His campaign has a familiar ring to it. He stresses strong family values. The plank of our campaign is this. Strong families equal a strong America. As my wife and I were talking about uh, who Steve Largent is, uh, if you could reduce that down to uh, three words, it would be convictions, compassion, and common sense. Thank you. Hi, how are you doing? Steve Largent. Nice to meet you. Good to meet you. I do all these brochures. In an age where Democrats control the White House, Steve's conservative Republican ideas have invited some harsh criticism. In fact, the field of politics may be even tougher than the gridiron. I got hit hard a lot in football, uh, but never in the back as often as I have in politics. Uh, you weather several 2 and 14 seasons and you develop thick skin, and you definitely have to have thick skin in politics. Given Steve's national popularity, his strong fundraising abilities, and his impeccable background, could an even higher office be in the future? The higher political office you can hold, the more opportunity you have to, to make a positive difference. Uh, so, you know, the same, same amount of time expended and, and more effect. And that really, uh, you know, that, that would intrigue me. But first comes the election on November 4th, win or lose, you can be sure this story will have a happy ending. I still have to pinch myself and uh, ask myself if it wasn't a dream. Walt Disney should do a movie on our life. I mean, it's been, uh, it's been, a, it's been storybook. Good luck to Steve Lee. I started playing football when I was seven years old. I first started, you know, I was an offensive lineman for like one year. Then after that, I started playing running back. And I remember times, you know, when I would be running the ball and I used to get, you know, personal fouls penalties called on myself because when I'd be running, I'd run so hard and I would drop my head and buck the kids and stuff like that. And the ref would, would call the personal fouls on me. But it was Natron's mom, Gwen, who threw the biggest flag, nearly ending her son's career before it got started. When I was in the seventh grade, you know, I was, I was going through one of those changes in my life where, you know, I get into a lot of trouble, you know, fights and stuff. And at the end of the school year, you know, they were sitting down and her and the principal were having a conference, and uh, the principal told my mom that he felt that I had the attitude that because I played football, that I should be getting special treatment, you know, that I, I felt I could get away with certain things that other kids couldn't. And she kind of like looked him in the face and she said, well, that's something you don't have to worry about next year. And she stood the ground, I didn't get to play. I had to set out my whole eighth grade year. Having learned his lesson, the Natron bomb began exploding in high school. He rushed for more than 2,000 yards his senior year while scoring 33 touchdowns. Then after back-to-back 1,000-yard -back seasons at North Carolina, Means left after his junior year but was only drafted in the second round. When Natron came out, he had two problems, I guess, if you, when you evaluate a player. One was that he was overweight, and, and the word was that he didn't like to work out a lot in the offseason. But this year, knowing he would no longer be a backup, Natron got a personal trainer and got down to business. The thing we wanted to get across to him, that to be a great back in this league for a long time, the best thing to do is never get out of shape and uh, stay in condition year-round. And then he has a chance to be one of the great backs in the, in the league, if he does that and take care of his body. I think my work ethics have changed a lot, though, you think? I mean, because now I realize that, you know, the off-season, you know, really plays such a big part of the end-season. So now, you know, I've learned a lot from it, and, uh, you know, I think I'm benefiting now. Leading the AFC with eight touchdowns, the 5'10", 240-pound means is deceptively fast. His distinct style has captivated the nation. I would describe him as uh, two people or two different type of runners. I think he's got the ability to be a a slash runner and make people miss. And then a bruising kind of an Earl Campbell run people over. He's the kind of back that punishes a tackler. When he gets hit, he doesn't go down. He kind of bounces off. He bounces off things like a bumper car. He 
he's really exciting. Even with all the impressive moves, Natron still sees himself as that average guy. I don't try and push the image of the macho NFL football player type guy, you know. I mean, I'm just, I'm still the same old person that I was, you know, when I was in high school. I'm laid back. I don't, I don't try, I mean, I'm, I don't try and be anything that I'm not. And I, I mean, that's just it. What, what you see is what you get. And helping to get the Chargers to the Super Bowl would definitely be a means to the perfect end. Brian Burwell tackles the tough issue surrounding Eric Metcalf's recent brush with the law. Why would they handcuff you for speeding? That's a question I've been asking for a long time. I have no answers. I guess they don't have, no an have any answers either. And Dan Marino explains to us the reasons for the Dolphins' success. Our defense is playing so outstanding right now, we want to try to continue to build on that. They played great last week. Got to play good. Got to, got to, got to play. Got to make some damn plays. Got to make some plays. Last Sunday, big plays by linebacker Michael Brooks and the Giant defense could not overcome the big blunders that continue to haunt their young and struggling quarterback, Dave Brown. Short drop right, slant in, picked off by Mike Johnson, back to the 40, he's got a picket line to the 30. To the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown Lions! Mike Johnson, interception. Young team, five. man. Young team, man. Got a young team. Sometimes it's good to keep them veterans, man. Pay them money and keep them veterans around, man. Indeed, it was a veteran, little Dave Maggot, who came up big for the Giants. He's one of the best. It's not a good punt, but it's Wiggly will be tough to handle. Maggot's got the 45, got to the 50, 45. Maggot goes outside of the 40 yard line. Still in bounds. The whistle. 40, 35, 30, 25, 20. He's going to score. Dave Maggot's fourth quarter return touched off a furious and curious chain of events that included a wake-up call by Lion running back Barry Sanders. They got the dangerous back in the NFL. He lobbed a break any minute. High formation. Mitchell runs the draw to Barry. Breaks a tackle to the outside. 35, he's to the 40. 45, 50. Here he's to the 40. He's on a streak. They'll never get him. 20, 15, 10. At the four yard line. Finally caught at the four yard line by Thomas Randolph. Third goal for the Lions. Tied at 18. Mitchell. Fade pattern. More caught. Touchdown. No, now they ruined it complete. They say he didn't have it long enough. He caught the ball. Oh. Juggling into the corner of the end zone. Holy mackerel. A fade route. Herman Moore went up over the top of the defender. Had the hands on it. Came down with it. Oh. Oh, well. And ball popped yeah, free, yeah. Well, it was. Good call. He bobbled it. Corey Raymond got it. No, wait hand. a minute. It's going to be overruled. He's going to call it a score. The ruling on the play. Touchdown. Holy mackerel. Man, oh, man, oh, man. Oh, this is going to. Oh, call man down. In zone. Every fan in Giants. Go, oh, man. That boy D had a ball in his hand. He's doing this here. The Giants did tie it up in the final seconds. Sending the game into an overtime that was knee deep in more controversy. Nine and a half to go overtime. Mitchell wants to throw. Mitchell fires. Caught Herman Moore. Hit. And did he go down? He's going. He's going to go. 20, 15. More to the 10. And inside of the eight yard line. I thought he was down. The contact knocked Herman Moore down, but he didn't go down to a knee. He and put a hand down. Oh, oh he yes, did go he down did. to a knee. Oh, he clearly patted knee down. Absolutely. Out. Herman Moore may have been down, but it was the Giants who were counted out when Jason Hansen booted the game-winning field goal. It'll be a 25-yard field goal. The snap is good. The placement is good. The kick is good, and the Lions win it in overtime, 28 to 25, over the New York Giants. The Giants lost their fifth straight, and things can only get worse this week in Dallas. Hey. 
It's gonna be a tough year, man. A stormy Halloween night in Chicago produced a bizarre array of tricks, treats, freaks, and menacing monsters like Bryce Pop, who notched two interceptions and a sack. Unable to throw in the stiff wind, Brett Favre spurred the pack with the longest run of his career. Favre is going to run for the first down. He's to the 30, the 25, to the 20, to the 15, to the 10, to the 5. He's and over. It's a for Brett Favre. All-purpose running back Edgar Bennett tallied two rushing touchdowns and caught a third. Statistically, the Bears have the worst defense against the rush in the NFL. In this game, the figures didn't lie as the Packers pounded out 223 yards. The Pack will try to grind out another win this week against the Lions. The skies over Denver's Mile High Stadium haven't been too friendly for the Broncos this year. But against the AFC Central leading Browns, who dropped in on Sunday, John Elway looked to reclaim the airways and continue Denver's resurrection. Here's Elway keeping. Elway is going to run it to the end zone, and now pass. It's caught. Jerry Evans. Denver's defense was nothing to gawk at either and made life in the pocket difficult for Vinny Testaverde, who will be sitting out this Sunday as a result of a hit he took on this play. With the Browns held at bay, Elway continued to perform, and an overanxious rookie, Antonio Langham, contributed to his 349 yards of passing. In the fourth quarter, it was Elway's second touchdown of the day that sealed the Broncos' victory. Here comes pressure again. Elway steps up. There's the pass. High jump. Catch over. Touchdown. Elway's antics have coach Wade Phillips pumped up again, and the Broncos hope to prove that they're no imposters when they visit the Rams this Sunday. The Browns have a big advantage this week. They're playing at home against the Patriots in the dog pound. Hey, let's go down to... First in Buffalo. Last Sunday, they returned to Ridge Stadium looking to avenge the championship game loss. What the Chiefs should have taken care of was defending Jim Kelly in the Bills' air attack. The throw. He lets it fly on the hitch and go. And it is caught for the touchdown by Andre Wayne. What a great reception. Kelly threw four touchdown passes and the Bills jumped to a 31-7 halftime lead. Unstoppable for Sunday was Buffalo's relentless pass rush. Montana to throw again. They're after him again. And he is sacked again and he fumbles the ball. Let's see how they will roll it. It is Buffalo ball. I spun the other way and then I then he went up field and made the Don't way. spin the top side now. Spin on, on the Spin on the undersell. He didn't reverse queen that way. I mean you gotta shut off that lane. No one could shut off Bruce Smith's lane to the quarterback as the Bills All-Pro harassed Joe Montana with a sack, two fumble recoveries, and one forced interception. Indeed, the scenes were more frightening than Frankenstein, more graphic than Pulp Fiction. It was a surprising domination that turned out to be child's play. It's the only place where grown men can act like kids. It's out here on this green stuff. And not get in trouble or get laughed at. It's fun, isn't it? Maybe a little violent at times, but it's all right. No matter how bad they want to count us out, baby, we always come back. Again and again and again. We like Jason, man. By the 13th. The Bills hope to be just as frightening this Sunday against the Jets. Great job. Everything went our way. Good luck to you. 
The Washington Redskins may be winless at home this year, but their adoring fans haven't lost the faith just yet. Against the Eagles, Gus Farad showed he was for real, singing two first-half touchdown passes. Back to pass, Farad in the end zone, touchdown, Washington Redskins. Tell me he didn't stick that one in there. He blazed it, didn't he? Farad may be a rookie on the rise, but Randall Cunningham is an old pro in his prime and calmly rallied the Eagles from an early deficit. Five, and he walks in for the touchdown. Herschel Walker get picks up a block by Freddie Barnett. And then he just walks into the end zone from about the two. In the second half, Farad found out that one does not enter the fraternity of NFL starting quarterbacks without a little hazy. Intercepted. Intercepted by Greg Jackson down the far sideline. He's at the 25, 20, 15, 10, 5. Touchdown! Greg the Eagles would soar into the lead, but Skins fans showed no sign of worry as they watched Farad bring their team back with his third touchdown pass of the day. Brooks the deep back. Brooks gets the dope. They throw the pass. Flag. Redskins score and fake me out. Too. The Redskins took the lead on a field goal, leaving the Eagles one final possession. Von Hebron's 17-yard run set up a do-or-die field goal attempt. This is the game. 23 seconds left. The ball is spotted. The kick is up. It's good! And the Eagles take the lead with 19 seconds left. The Redskins have another chance for a home victory this week, but they'll have to knock off the 49ers to get it. Coming up, Miami's many highlights over New England and a talk with their quarterback, Dan Marino. Right corner of the end zone, and Turner with a diving catch for the touchdown! The Jets, however, were bolstered by some defensive magic of their own as Mo Lewis lifted the curtain on Mikowski. Well, pressure on, screen play, pass too hot, and it is intercepted this time by Mo Lewis. Breaks away, 10-5, touchdown! Fueled by five cold turnovers, the Jets stayed close with some aerial sleight of hand. But the second half of the show saw Indianapolis leave New York behind in a cloud of smoke, with special effects provided not by Penn and Teller, but by running backs Ronald Humphrey and rookie sensation number 28, Marshall Falk, who rushed for 110 yards and two touchdowns. Runs on the left side, cuts back, finds a crease, side steps him out of the 25, the 20, 15, 10, he cuts back and goes in! Touchdown, Marshall Falk on a beautiful zigzag run! With some magic back in their offense, the Colts hope to get to the 500 mark this Sunday in Miami. This is Marino's leg. We killed him. He will not make it through the day. Dan Marino had beaten the Patriots nine straight times as the Dolphins ventured up to Foxborough for some mischief night matters. Back in New England, say hi to all the old fans, the ones that loved me and the ones that hated me. Probably more hated me than love me. Good to be back, though. Always good to come back. Irving Fryer hauled in three of Marino's five touchdown passes in their meeting eight weeks ago, an exhilarating shootout that featured nearly 1,000 yards and 74 points. This rematch would be quite different. Oh, man, we did it again. Be alert in case he tries to reverse his field on us. Knock him out, baby. Get him back down there, shake him up. And defensively, we take it away. Offense points on the board. Let's go. of a shotgun back to throw. Myers intercepted at midfield by Mike Harlan Barnett. Down to the 45 yard line of the Dolphins and the Patriots. For years, the Dolphins have been Dan Marino. No D, no rush, no balance. Not anymore. Please, Marino. That was a 10 inch go back to 7 yards. It's been sad between you and Tim. They need to. If he don't double you, you got to make that play. 
Miami's resurgent defense held Drew Bledsoe to a season low 125 yards and picked off three of his passes. Bledsoe is back, a four-man rush. He's under some pressure. Drew Bledsoe hit, he throws, it's tipped, and it's intercepted at the 30-yard line. It's as if Sherman set the way back machine to 1972 when they were champions and a no-name defense set up easy rushing touchdowns. Miami's meat grinder of a running game kept Bledsoe off the field. You see, now the Dolphins, uh, excuse me, Keith, you explain it. Now, now that you so rudely interrupt my conversation, this game's a little rougher than I thought it was, so I better stretch out. It's a little while left to go. But that running game's working well, so it should be all right. <laughs> Bernie Parmalee led the charge, carrying 25 times for 123 clock-burning yards, a team record 273 in his last two games. It was another 70s flashback when power running set up Bob Greasy, and now Marino for wide-open play-action touchdown. Marino, play-action. He's rolling out to the right, throws to Byers at the five. Keith Byers is into the corner. Touchdown, Dolphin. My goodness gracious, have the Dolphins seized this one. Who's got to keep running the ball each and every game? This Sunday, the division-leading Dolphins host the Colts as Parmalee and Marshall Falk will try to outdo each other in Miami. Well, you know, I think my actions will speak for you know, himself. And all I can do is go out there and run the ball when called upon and uh, try to help my team win. So if that's making a statement, so be it, you know, and I'm gonna continue to run hard and, and uh, we're gonna continue to um, knock some people off the ball. in with the Cardinals, but after putting on some mascara, Bam Morris and the Steelers came out and gave the Cardinals a big black eye. A long setback behind O'Donnell is Bam, and he gets the call. Turning the corner at the 10, he's got blockers to the 5, and Bam's into the end zone on an 11-yard gallop. Back is O'Donnell on second down, throws his left hander, 50, we got a Steeler in the open field, Steeler Touchdown all the way is Yancey Thickpen. He takes it 60 yards. How about that? Buddy Ryan, the Rush Limbaugh of NFL coaches, answered by turning loose the normally conservative Arizona offense. A 17-17 deadlock sent the game into overtime with matters resting on the foot of the Cardinals' Greg Davis. Back ball down, kick is up, it's high, it's long, it is down! And the Cardinals win it! The Steelers hope for a makeover this week against the 1-7 Oilers. In L.A., the Raiders didn't exactly resemble superheroes, but Houston's costume was actually pretty convincing as they impersonated a contender for the first three quarters. In the end, though, the Oilers were less powerful Michael Keaton and more paunchy Adam West as these Jokers gave up the lead late in the fourth quarter. And Hosteller is back to throw. Looking over the middle, he's flushed out, rolls over to the right run side. It, run it. He's got Brown coming back to the near side, fires, Brown's there. Touchdown, Raiders! Incredible! With only seconds remaining, Houston's last chance was for an Al Del Greco field goal to send the game into overtime. On the way, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up, hit the crossbar and no good. It's back to the bat cave for the Oilers who host arch nemesis Pittsburgh this week. Coming up, a surprisingly difficult Cowboys victory and a look back at the unforgettable Tank Younger. There's the snap, Erickson pulls back, three-step, drop, fires, but it's picked off by Parker at the 30, Parker at the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5, touchdown Vikings, Anthony Parker 
After Anthony Parker's third touchdown in three weeks, Terry Allen scored from 37 yards out. Terry Allen breaks a tackle at the 20. He's at the 15, at the 10. He's at the 5. Touchdown, Vikings. Terry Allen. Tampa Bay did catch Minnesota off guard with a 62-yard bomb, but it was not enough to defuse Minnesota. On the deep post downfield toward Wilson, makes the other shoulder catch to the 20, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown Tampa Bay! The explosive 6-2 and two Vikings return home to take on the Saints this week. A bombshell fell in Cincinnati last Sunday, but it wasn't that the Bengals were holding open tryouts for quarterback. Third string unknown Jeff Blake took the snaps against Dallas, and his performance was the big surprise. Going deep, down the middle of the field. He wants yes! Scott, he's got him. Yes! Scott is going to go all the way for the touchdown. Blake emerged from obscurity with his inaugural touchdown pass, but he has a long way to go to be the most well-known face in the crowd. Perhaps his second score as commander-in-chief will garner him more recognition. Got down the middle of the field, got wide open is Scott, he's got it, and he's in for the end zone, and the touchdown. After Blake made a name for himself and put the Bengals up by 14, the Cowboys had to defend their title and battle back. Troy Aikman took over the limelight and completed 20 passes for 272 yards and two scores. Slot left, Johnston motion right, Aikman back, deep drop, throw it for the bunch into the end zone, up in the air, cut, it's a touchdown, Alvin Harper. Alvin Harper's leaping grab and another by Michael Irvin helped end the Bengals' hopes of an upset. It's for Irvin, right side of the end zone, up in the air, touchdown Cowboys. While the Cowboys breathe a sigh of relief, the Bengals must take heart in their close call and try for their first win against Seattle this Sunday. The Seahawks went toe-to-toe -to -toe against the Chargers last week, and in this stand, San Diego showed all the right moves. Ronnie Harmon's one-handed catch and ensuing 15-yard touchdown run ignited to San Diego's scoring spree. To run a draw, Ronnie Harmon runs to the 15, runs to the 10, runs to the 5. The only scare for the Chargers was an injury to quarterback Stan Humphreys. Everybody into the pattern. Here's Humphreys to throw. Here comes the blitz. He rambles left and he's going to be sacked back at the Fumble. middle. Fumbles. He's down. Those are going to say he was down. And Stan is in pain again. Stan went down. With backup Gail Gilbert, however, San Diego never missed a beat. And Tony Martin's touchdown capped off 35 Charger points. Seattle did manage one last gasp in the fourth quarter. A 93-yard kickoff return by John Vaughn. You know, booted to John Vaughn at the 7. Vaughn is coming right, goes to the 10, to the 15, trying to get outside. Weaves his way back to the middle of the field, across the 30. Look out, here comes Johnny Vaughn to the 40-yard line, breaks a tackle. He's down the sidelines, got one man to beat. He cuts at the 20. He's going to go all the way and score. At 7-1, tied with only Dallas for the best record in the NFL, the Chargers now face Atlanta. Glad to be here. All right, Dan, I know Parmalee is doing an outstanding job. Now, he's been there for three years. You're an outstanding judge of talent. I know that. You're being a quarterback. Did you see any of this talent in the last couple of years? Well, Bernie's always done well uh, in preseason and in practice and in uh, training camps and stuff, but it's just one of those things where if you come in as a free agent running back, uh, you make the team on special teams, and you never really get a chance to prove yourself in game situations. And, and now with a couple injuries, Terry Kerber going down and uh, him playing well this past preseason, he's getting his opportunity, and he's really taking advantage of it. Danny, I look at your role on the team. You know, you've always been a prolific passer. But in the last couple of ball games with the you know, emergence of Parmalee, the running game, I see where you're throwing more underneath the defense, more the Keith Byers and the Keith Jackson, less to your wide receivers. Are you comfortable with this type of an offense? Uh, no doubt. I, I think it's something when there's big plays that are available, you're going to take them. And we will do that, and we'll do that in the future. 
um, when when you uh, play a team like New England, they were blitzing a lot. We weren't hitting some big plays. Then we started running the ball. They started playing a little more zone, and we were able to hit the ball underneath and throw it to Byers and Jackson to get some things going. Yeah, I am comfortable with it, and if we have to do that to win, that's what we'll do. Danny, your defense has been so much improved over the last couple of ball games. How much of that do you attribute to the fact they put Brian Cox in the middle and sort of made him the leader of that defense? Well, I think it really uh, helped to have Brian in the middle. He's, uh, it gives him a chance to, to roam the whole field, to get closer to more plays, I think. And uh, he is a leader of our defense. He's a hard worker. He's a smart guy. I think he's studying, studying the other team's films and the defenses more now than he has before. Uh, and uh, our defense is just playing so outstanding right now. We want to try to continue to build on that. They played great last week. Danny, I don't want to look too far into the future because you have Indianapolis coming up this week. But if you're going to advance in the playoffs and win the AFC championship, you have to go through Buffalo. Now, as you look at your team and you look at the team, is this team equipped to do it finally this year? Yeah, I, I believe we're, we're, we're a team that has a chance to uh, get to the Super Bowl. And, yeah, you do have to beat Buffalo, and you have to beat a lot of good AFC teams uh, 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 to get to that position. And Buffalo is one of the teams that's been in the Super Bowl the last four years, and we're going to have to be concerned about them. We have them home uh, in December. Right now we're one game up, one game up in the AFC East, and uh, we're just going to have to try to continue to build on that each week. Cardinals, a team full of former Philly favorites, would be an understatement. When it comes to the players, however, some seem to have found long lost love. Maybe that's why the war and waiting between Buddy Ryan's former birds and his current ones never came off. That it wouldn't happen was evident from the Eagles' first offensive play when Randall Cunningham laid rest to the ridiculous rumors that he might be intimidated and then openly fraternized with Lorenzo Lynch. The Eagles' defense did not respond in kind. In fact, it took a good defensive play by the Eagles to create the Cardinals' longest run of the day. Arizona had only one play longer than Larry Center's fumble recovery as the Eagle defense yielded just one meaningless touchdown. For the Philadelphia offense, the game was one of tactics, not thuggery. When the Cardinals rushed just four men, the Eagles line handled it perfectly, and Cunningham found open spaces between the rush men and the backpedaling linebackers and secondary. Cunningham would wind up as the game's leading rusher as he easily ran through the Cardinals or simply passed over them. Here we go! Just laying it out there. There was only one person who could get the ball, and that was Fred Barnett. What are you catch? You got to get up in this zone now. Hey, you still gonna get dirty? You think dirty is going up? First and ten, the ball at midfield. Gonna have with a short drop. Now he is gonna roll. Touchdown! Yeah! Yeah! He's looking. He is firing deep down the middle, and it is deflected and caught. But it's a flex and Fred Barnett scores. The slugfest was instead a love fest, and while the Cardinals look one game ahead to the Giants, Eagles fans have set somewhat loftier goals. The Giants started the season 3-0, full of swagger with visions of the playoffs in their heads. Then everything went blurry. They came to in Dallas on Monday, but didn't like what they saw. Oh. <laughs> 
The voracious Cowboy defense stuffed the run and sacked Dave Brown and Kent Graham a total of four times. On offense, the Cowboys were paced, as usual, by Emmett Smith, who rushed for 163 yards and two touchdowns, and dragged a few Giants along just for fun. First and goal at the one. Eggman handoff Smith dances in. Touchdown, Cowboys. Roy Aikman also did double duty, throwing for a touchdown. Good protection. Pump deep to the middle. Pump, touchdown. What a catch, Alvin Harper. Then running for another. Bootleg right, looking for Goldberg, running to the five. Touchdown, Aikman. The touchdown landslide just kept on coming. First and goal of the nine. Pinball wizard come to mind when you see him. The Giants are stuck in a rut. This week, the Cowboys travel to San Francisco to take on the 49ers in the big one. This is Dion's house, ain't it? No, I say Dion's house no more. Splash's house. San Diego's defense looked to stop Atlanta. Border Patrol. Right. Nobody crosses. Right. Nobody crosses. Got to get checked when you cross the border. But the San Diego Border Patrol certainly didn't check Atlanta on their first possession. The Falcons easily cleared customs and then drove deep into Charger territory, smuggling its red gun offense along the way to cap off an impressive drive with a touchdown. Nine, third down, Jeff George back to pass, swings it out, there's the catch. That should be a first down. Mathis breaks the tackle at the five. He's at the two, he's at the one. He's in for a touchdown! Oh, baby! What a second and third effort by Terrence Mathis! All he was going to get was the first down. He got more. He got six. Those six points proved to be crucial as Mathis's extra effort yielded the only touchdown of the day. And while the Falcons seemed inspired by George Foreman's new heavyweight title, the Chargers starting quarterback Stan Humphrey stood on the sidelines, nursing his injured non-throwing arm. But both Humphreys and his elbow were probably glad to sit this one out as both teams exchanged defensive knockouts. The Falcons' defense held San Diego to only three field goals, a feat that had the place jumping. Way to go, Big Jump! <laughs> Look tired, baby, huh? <laughs> yeah! Way to go, Big Jump! Way to go, Jump. Way to go, man. That's it, baby. Let's go. We got New Orleans next, baby. One down. One down. Seven more to go. Seven more to go. <laughs> hey, how's your elbow? Man? You all right? Hopefully, Humphrey's elbow will be well enough to play this Sunday when the Chargers will need him against the Chiefs. It was election time in Washington, so don't be misled by false expectations. But this was one game that actually delivered as promised, a high level of excitement and big plays by the 49ers. And Young drops back to throw and goes downfield, and Brent Jones is all alone! Can he win the foot race to the 25, the 20, the 15, the 10, the 5, into the end zone! Brent Jones, the longest touchdown runner of his career, 69 yards. Deep drop by Young, throws down the middle, he's got it, complete to right! He beats the defender, cuts into the middle to the 50, cuts to the left, he's at the 45! One man has an angle. Although Rice did not catch a touchdown pass, he did add to his all-time record. And a reverse to Jerry Rice, and Young is there to block. He's to the 20 by the 20, he's to the 10, touchdown 49ers. Jerry Rice scores another one, number 132, untouched. For Jerry Rice, the NFL's touchdown incumbent, it was number 132. That means 49ers safety Tim McDonald needs about 130 more to catch his teammate after this 73-yard interception return.
Despite the early polls, the Redskins made a late push. Harvey scoops the ball. It's loose. It's picked up. Picked up by Morrison going far side. It's a live ball, and it's a touchdown. Washington Redskins. But the final returns indicated who the clear-cut winner was. Carter waits for it at the four-yard line. Comes up to the 10. Up to his right to the 20, gets to the 25 to the 30, 35 to the 40, 45, still in bounds at the 50, down the sideline to the 30, down to the 20, down to the 10, the touchdown for the 49ers, 97 yard touchdown run by Dexter Carter. Talk about a big play day for San Francisco. And the 49ers will need more big plays this Sunday against Dallas. Coming up. Considering the Bills hadn't lost a game at the Meadowlands since 1986, Jets fans had reason to jeer. New York needed a win to stay above 500 and would have to pull out all the stops. Rob Moore's 31-yard catch and run set up a field goal, but this team had to work on getting in the end zone. Buffalo, on the other hand, made few mistakes in the first half, scoring two touchdowns with relative ease. And a running play. Thurman is down and in for the touchdown. He went in standing up without a hand. Away. Second and ten for the Bills at the Jets 37. Kelly to throw again. And down there is BB. He's got a touchdown. And BB on the hitch and go. Caught it at the right corner. And Buffalo led by 11, but Jets fans had faith in their quarterback. The Jets had the lead, but New York's defense needed to shut down one of the most explosive offenses in the league to preserve the victory. Even the Bills' last gasp fell short. Fourth and seven. Look, look, look. Throws. Incomplete. Jets take over. At five and four, the Jets now head to Green Bay. Well, you know, it's, it's a great win, and anytime you can, you know, you can beat Buffalo twice in the same year, which is something the Jets haven't done in a long time. Uh, you know, it's real significant. Uh, you got to give credit to the entire football team. Our, you know, the entire team played great, and uh, I'm just really, really satisfied with uh, the toughness that our guys showed, and and we hung in there and beat one of the best teams in football. In Minnesota, while one Viking was out cruising on his hog, a host of Vikings made like piggies, gorging themselves at the offensive trough. Chris Carter scarfed down a game-high 12 balls. Jake Reed got fat on eight catches of his own. The man behind this statistical pigging out was Warren Moon, who passed for over 400 yards and two touchdowns. Well protected, he throws into the end zone. Touchdown, Jay Green! But it wasn't exactly famine for the Saints either, as Jim Everett tossed two touchdowns of his own, and the Saints were up by six late. But on the final possession, Moon drove the Vikes to the Saints' 11, setting up a do-or-die play to win it all. Moon with a snap back to throw. Looking, looking, fires, caught by Ismail. Spin move inside. Go! At 7-2, the Vikings have a comfortable lead in the NFC Central. This week, they take on a New England team that after four straight losses is, well, a little irritable. The Pats took out their frustrations on new Browns starter Mark Rippon. A swirling wind and a swarming Browns defense frustrated Drew Bledsoe as he threw four interceptions. 
In the fourth quarter, the Browns broke a three-all tie with the game's only touchdown. Horn goes in motion. Rippin has Horn open. He throws, and Leroy puts it away. Touchdown, Browns. It wasn't a sure-handed catch, but it'll count. Cleveland's 7-2 start may have the fans dreaming of Miami, but the Browns will be in Philadelphia this week for a crucial matchup that could well shape their season. Disdaining modern communications, the Bengals resorted to a novel approach to sending in their plays. As usual, something got lost in the translation, and Cincinnati seemed doomed to lose its ninth straight of the season. But Seattle, which had lost four games in a row, was mired in a miserable offensive slump. Meyer in the shotgun has the ball. He's back to throw. In his own end zone is tackled by Albert yes. Williams for the safety. Yes. And it is. It's a safety. With the score tied at 17 in overtime, Jeff Blake, who threw for almost 400 yards, found rookie sensation Darnay oh, Scott. Blitz, but he's going way downfield. Oh, over the top we go again. Oh, he's got it. Oh, he's got it. Oh, the 15, 20, 10, oh, and knocked out of bounds at the 8-yard line. Oh, baby. 75 yards. Teams are lined up and set. The ball is snapped, placed down, and booted. It's up. It's over. It's over. And While David Shula savored his first victory, the Seahawks next play the Broncos, who last week played a Ram team that seemed ready to jump all the way to St. Louis or even Baltimore. What they really jumped on was first John Elway and then the undermanned Bronco defense. Handler back to throw. He sets. He fires. He's got Anderson at the five. Touchdown, Los Angeles! And but the Rams' cushy 24-6 fourth quarter lead evaporated with the sudden appearance of Elway's comeback magic. And here's Milburn wide open. It's a touchdown! However, the furious rally fell mercifully short, and this week the victorious Rams faced their crosstown rival Raiders, who had their hands full last Sunday night against the Chiefs. This in-your-face rivalry has always been more physical than finesse, but that doesn't mean players aren't allowed to look their best with a few personal fashion statements. If they win the toss, you know you got your earring in? Yeah, that's all right. We'll take the ball. With earrings and designer the nose bandages in place, the Chiefs were certainly dressed for success. <laughs> Neither offense, however, would look pretty on this night. It was a game dictated by defense, sloppy play, and 21 penalties. Parker, tell them that it's false start. They don't have a choice. No Both offenses seem completely out of sync. What? The legal form. What? The Chiefs overcame their confusion long enough for the game's lone touchdown. Montana rolling left in trouble. Fires the pass. Cut by Walker to 45. To the 40, 35. He's in the open field. 20, 15, 10, 5, touchdown, big play, Kansas City, Joe Montana to Derek Walker. I saw, I saw your eyes light up. Way up the field. I was like, oh, he was way up the field on me. We're not hanging out. We got to keep grinding. We're fighting the field position deal, but keep fighting your grinding. Keep grinding. Keep grinding. You're fighting your ass off. Keep grinding on them. We'll wear them down. Let's go. Let's wear them out. Let's wear them out. With defensive end Neil Smith casting aside blockers like Tom Rathman, the Chiefs stormed in on Jeff Hostetler. Smith connected for two of the Chiefs' five sacks. Don't lose sight of Whopper. Don't lose sight of Whopper. It's showing up. Whopper. The Chiefs' big Whoppers pounded Hoss like hamburger all night. Stadler and the frustrated Raiders trailed 13 to 3 late in the fourth quarter. Now listen, we are going to have to go one more series. We got to go one more series. It's going to be a four down series, and we got to get it done and get out. Now let's go. 
In their final series, the Raiders took their last desperate shots at reaching the end zone. Rocket Ismail touchdown was denied, and on the next play, the Chiefs officially snuffed out the Raiders' hopes. The Raiders at the 45, their own, now they throw over the middle, the pass is intercepted! Charles Vinci to 35! Charles Vinci with the interception! Yes, Great job, defense! Great job, Dan! Great job! This week, the Chiefs defense will have to come up big against Natron Means and the NFL's number one rushing attack as Kansas City faces a critical showdown with the Chargers. Coming up, the Dolphins come back over the Colts and a look back at wide receiver Danny Abramowitz. Especially at home. But last Sunday at Joe Robbie Stadium, it was the Colts who began in a feeding frenzy. Indianapolis was all over Dan Marino, intercepting him twice, the second for a touchdown, helping themselves to a 21-12 fourth quarter lead. Mike Marino sets up, throws to the near side, it's picked up, it's intercepted by Buchanan, and he's going to score! Ray Buchanan stepped right in front of the would-be receiver, Mark Ingram, and dances all the way to the end zone for a touchdown. Right to the right, and again to Falk, who hurdles up near the goal line, and we it is a touchdown! But the Colts would cast no more magic as Marino led a 10-point comeback in the final four minutes. Marino pulls it down in the shotgun. He's looking, throws down the middle. Complete to McDuffie at the five. Makes a move. He's in. Touchdown, Dolphins. Good God almighty. What a catch and effort by O.J. McDuffie. The snap is down. The field goal attempt is up. It's good. Miami extended its lead in the tough AFC East and this week faced the Bears, who came to Tampa Bay expecting a dog of a game against the Buccaneers. However, last Sunday, Tampa Bay wasn't barking. They were biting with a rabid defense. Dave Wanstead needn't have worried as the Bucks ultimately reverted from rabid to rotten, allowing Steve Walsh two easy touchdown passes. And here's Roll the out. Hand There up. he is, wide open. Yeah. Out of the end zone. Yes, wide open. Keith Jennings. Walsh back to throw a quick over the yes, middle. Yes, touchdown, yes. Robert Green. Walsh is now 4-0 as the Chicago quarterback, while rookie Trent Dilfer sweated out another poor outing. This week, the Bucks face off against Detroit, who feature the man who has rewritten the NFL record book on kick returns. Mel Gray wasted no time against Green Bay in adding another chapter. He on the kickoff, high, once again not deep, but this time Mel Gray will handle it. 10, 15, far side 20, middle of the field 25, 30, first to the open, look out, 40, Mel 50, one man to beat the kicker, he's Good. off, Mel Gray will take it the distance. It is a touchdown, Mel Gray goes 90 yards. Touchdown Lions, Mel Gray. Detroit quarterback Scott Mitchell was ineffective, throwing an interception to number 95 Bryce Pop that resulted in six for the Packers. And when Mitchell broke his hand and left the game, Brett Favre led Green Bay to a lead it would not relinquish. to the left, Edgar Bennett. Got to get rid of one man, does. Oh, to the he's gone, line. he's gone. To the five, touchdown, Edgar Bennett. Another loss for the up and down Lions and a big win for the Packers who are back in the playoff hunt and face the Jets this week. The Steelers' Kevin Green may seem like a harmless shaggy teddy bear, but try telling that to Oilers quarterback Cody Carlson, who was sacked six times by Green and the Pittsburgh defense. The bumbling Oilers and underachieving Steelers traded field goals until a 9-9 tie sent them into overtime. In overtime, Gary Brown's fumble set up Gary Anderson for the game-winning field goal. 
The snap is down. Anderson's kick is on its way. It's long enough. It's high enough. And this game is over. The Steelers win. Anderson's 40-yarder and the only game this year not to feature a touchdown. The 6-3 and three Steelers face Buffalo this week. He is the 49ers version of a rebel with a cause. Ricky Waters, the renegade running back. With Rick Waters comes, you know, a guy who's going to get spirited, going to get excited. You know, a guy who's going to wear gold chains and, you know, an earring and all that kind of stuff. You know, that all comes with it. Ricky Waters' brash style doesn't really seem to fit in with the laid-back personality of San Francisco or with the business-like professionalism of the 49ers. But even though he has no intention of conforming, this is a guy who has found a way to fit in. They are allowing me to be myself, and they have already expressed to me that they like who I am. You know, they like the way I go about my business, and they know that if I'm on the field, I'm going to get the job done, and that's all that really matters, you know? And I'm not going to do anything that's going to embarrass the organization. So that's the only thing they really care about. Without question, the 49ers image is being redefined by a new generation of spark plugs. Along with fullback William Floyd and Deion Sanders, Waters is helping to energize the team with sincere emotion. I think he helped the team. I think Ricky needs to be Ricky. Uh, Jerry is Jerry and Steve is going to be Steve. And uh, I think the fact that Ricky is a very excitable, very emotional guy kind of adds a little more flavor to what the 49ers are doing at this point. So uh, uh, we want him to be himself. He's playing very well. And uh, if he wants to be exciting and, uh, and emotional, just, just be himself. Don't, uh, don't try to change. But Ricky insists he has changed. Still close to his immediate family, he's more comfortable with himself now, and his past obsession with being the guy has subsided. Before, I, I just couldn't understand. I'm like, I'm a good back. I know how to run a ball. I would think that you want to just shove that thing in my stomach and just give it to me all the time. And even now, as Ricky looks ahead to being a free agent next year, his priorities have changed, expanded beyond individual goals. And you told me, could I be on a, a team that's, would I rather be on a team that I would carry the ball all the time, but we would never even make the playoffs, or the team I'm on now, that I'm almost assured of making the playoffs at least, and I'm not carrying the ball as much, I would rather be on a team that's winning. Waters admits Emmett Smith probably has the best of all worlds. Last year, when the Cowboys and the 49ers met in the regular season, Ricky was angered when his eight carries were compared to Emmett's 27. But this season, the fourth-year pro claims there is no agenda to outdo Smith. If he were to get 180 yards and we beat them, and I just get 50 yards, but we beat them, then I'll be happy. No one player can be greater than the team or you won't win because we're going to need offense, defense, special teams. We're going to make need some big plays by guys that maybe don't usually make big plays. You know, we're going to need that this week. And it's not going to be one player out there that wins this game. No way. He may not be the 49ers' only weapon, but he is powerful and dangerous. Anytime uh, big games like this come up, you have to have a guy that uh, wants the ball and who's going to make things happen. He's the type of guy that uh, you want the ball in his hand. So I'm sure they'll find a way to have uh, Ricky Waters be a very, very important part of this game. Unlike the Ricky Waters of a few years ago, this young man is no longer totally consumed by his football career. Despite preparing for this week's showdown with the Cowboys, he still found time for another passion, helping the American Cancer Society. And while retirement seems light years away, Waters is also developing a possible post-football career, hosting a weekly pregame TV show in the Bay Area. I have some skills in broadcasting. People have told me that, so I said, well, let me go out here and try and see. And I'm having so much fun with it, and I'm learning, and I'm getting better at it. And it's always good to know that you're getting better at something, and you're working hard for it. Ricky Waters has worked hard to grow and mature on and off the field. But he wouldn't be Ricky if he didn't have fun every step of the way. No, I wouldn't say that I'm not concerned. Uh, it is a concern of mine, uh, but yet I tried some different face masks, some different things throughout the course of the last two weeks, and I just haven't felt comfortable with it. Uh, you know, as I've said before, I'm still wearing the same shoulder pads that I wore in college, and I think any time I go out and I try to make adjustments to the equipment that I'm accustomed to wearing, uh, it, I think about it too much, and I want to have as few distractions on the field as I can. Well, it sounds like superstition to me, Troy, but, <laughs> but you know, Eric Williams, your great offensive tackle, is out for the year. Now I look at Nate Newton and uh, uh, Derek Kennard, and, and they're banged up, and Jay Novacek is hurting. 
Does this make you nervous knowing that these guys may not be 100% blocking for you and Emmett Smith? Well, I think it's a concern for all of us. I think we feel good about the players that we're going to have coming in and taking those guys' place if, in fact, these players are unable to play. But uh, there's no question, as I said earlier in the season, that we were going to truly find out the effects of free agency once we got into the middle of the season and started having some injuries and seeing what was going to happen at that time. And we're not a team with as much depth as what we've had in the past, and that's been one of our real strengths as a football team. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed and hoping that these players will, will heal up rather quickly and we'll be able to continue to play with them, but I, it, it's tough to say at this time. Troy, Alvin Harper is hurt. Michael Irvin will probably get double teamed on every single snap. Is Kevin Williams really ready to carry the load for the passing game? Well, I think he's playing a little earlier than what we would hope. Uh, you know, certainly he's come in in our third down situations when we go three wides, play slot receiver. Uh, you know, now we're asking him to come in as an every down wide receiver and make some plays for us. I, I think he has the ability to do it. Uh, certainly we're going to have to scale back a, a little bit as to what he's going to be able to do. There's been talk that uh, Alvin may, in fact, be able to play this week. So we're hoping that he'll be able to. Mm. I'm pretty confident that Jay will be out there playing. Uh, so we are a team that's on the men, but yet at the same time, I think we're going to have a lot of those guys back, regardless of whether or not Alvin's back. There's no question, Troy, that the 49ers, for them, this is their Super Bowl. You guys, last three times that you've played, Dallas has beaten them handily. They went out in the offseason. They pick up Norton. They pick up Sanders, a bunch of free agents. Now they think they have the talent to match up with the Cowboys. First of all, do they have the talent? And for you, is this just another game? Well, I think they've had the talent in the past. The problem is, is that they just haven't played as well as what we have in those three ball games. They've certainly made a made a conscious effort during the off season, to, off season to upgrade their defensive football team. In my opinion, they've done that. Now the question is whether or not we, as an offensive football team, are better than we were a year ago or not. And I think that we're going to find that out on Sunday, is to see where the two teams have gone. Troy, thank you very much. Spoken like a true quarterback that you are. Good luck this week, and please stay healthy. Thank you. Mr. Jimmy Johnson, a more subdued shirt this week. <laughs> I want to ask you about the Cowboys and Emmett Smith. He's owned the 49ers. Now, what are the 49ers going to have to do to slow him down? Well, the biggest thing about Emmett Smith, he's going to get his yardage when he's going up against a seven-man front. You know, what teams have tried to do to slow him down is they involve somebody out of the secondary, the defensive backfield, and give the, the front an eight-man front to get the extra man against the running game against Emmett Smith. When they do that, though, that's one-on-one -on -one coverage for those wide receivers, and that's where they get the points, and that's where they get the big plays. Now, Jimmy, I had really been suspect of the 49er defense early in the season. But the last four ball games, eight interceptions, 13 sacks. I think the big reason is the two defensive tackles, Dana Stubberfield, Brian Young, getting pressure up the middle. Now they're going up against a nicked Dallas offensive line. Can they get to Troy Aikman? Well, Nick, I think as far as those offensive guards, they're going up against 350 pounders if they're really accurate about their weight. And <laughs> they may be nicked up just a little bit, but they're still big men, and it's really difficult to get a lot of pressure on Troy Aikman, especially since he throws the ball on rhythm, he, he gets rid of the football, and he doesn't hold it. And so, you know, teams don't sack Troy Aikman that much. And on top of that, he's got the wide receivers can make something happen once they get the football.